draft. It is the 17th day of September 2012. And we kicked the week off with uh, a guy I've been trying to get on the program for several months. Uh, but, of course, he's been real busy being a senior advisor on uh, Ron Paul's uh, campaign. Doug Weed is going to join us here in uh, in just a minute. And there's tons of stuff I want to go over with him. Um, and, and I'm going to start the, the program off with a, a commentary video, at least the topic of a commentary video that I just posted. And I want to, I want to get uh, Doug's take on this as well because it's it's all related, of course. But you see, th- this is the this is the the crux of it, and the crux of the, this commentary video I'm putting out tonight, the crux of everything that's happening uh, with the mainstream media right now in this uh, this silly season, this uh, Kabuki theater uh, that is this election running up into November, is you know it, we're supposed to forget what has happened in our own country, and I'm not talking going back to the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, the creation of uh, the Federal Reserve in 1913, the creation of uh, the income tax a year later. I'm not talking the closing of the gold window in 1971. I'm not talking 9-11 and uh, uh, Greenspan's zero interest rate policy and bubble uh, bubble economy. I'm going back just four short years, four short years to 2008, September 2008 to be exact, when uh, all hell seemed to break loose on the financial uh, side of things, and we've entered into this phenomenon, this engineered phenomenon by this central banking cabal engineered phenomenon that we've known as uh, the bailout and the too big to fail uh, situation that we face right now. See, we're sitting here in a nation that is $16 trillion in debt. At that time, we were about $9 trillion in debt. At this time, we're sitting with 46 million people on food stamps, which is about 20,000 more than it was at that time. We're sitting on a million plus foreclosures a year, sitting on a million plus uh, bankruptcies a year. We're sitting on every kind of uh, uh, a social safety net program being implemented possible in order to paper over and pretend that we were growing uh, because of stimulus packages and bailouts and trillions of dollars being committed. And we're supposed to believe above all that we have a difference uh, to choose from this November. right? We, we saw the Tea Party come uh, out in 2007, 2008, and then quickly co-opt by the uh, far right wing of the Republican Party to where it's marginalized. I mean, they had a little victory in 2010, but nothing changed. Government did get smaller. We didn't uh, ask Wall Street uh, to pay uh, to pay up for its carnage that's wreaked, uh, wreaked on this planet. Nothing has changed. We pigeonhole them into the far right wing of the Republican Party. We drive on to 2012, and we're not supposed to remember what happened just four short years ago. We're supposed to pretend we're in a new time now. We're supposed to pretend we re, we uh, saved the economy in 2008. We've turned the corner. We're, we're in the midst of recovery. And then all of a sudden, we'll start blaming everything else, be it China, be it uh, Europe with their uh, their sovereign debt crisis, be it the Middle East or North Africa, anything and everything other than the true people, the true group that brought us here. In fact, a story came out today that's uh, hidden in the headlines. This story is a topic of, of tonight's commentary video, which was mortgage, mortgage cops take a tough stance. Now, this has everything to do with the condition of our nation right now. This is, uh, this is a story about uh, how the FHFA uh, is now overseeing Freddie and Fannie. The enforcement uh, division of it is overseeing the activities of Freddie and Fannie. Now, Freddie and Fannie are government agencies at this point only because in 2008 we had to start rescuing them to the tunes of hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars. So now they they have full oversight uh, under FHFA, and these are gun-toting agents that can go out and enforce the uh, the regulation and the laws. And they came out with a statement today saying that, quote, this is a Treasury official, quote, we are going to start locking people up. Now, were they talking about these uh, institutions on Wall Street where you know they were AAA raiding a bunch of garbage and then selling it around the world so we can end up uh, destroying uh, economies? Nope. Were they talking about, you know, the collusion between Washington, D.C. and Wall Street and letting, uh, you know, these uh, special interest right legislation that allowed this kind of thing to happen? Uh, sorry, that isn't it either. They're issuing statements at the Treasury. We're going to start locking people up, referring to the people in this country who strategically defaulted uh, that had Freddie and Fannie uh, mortgages. And the fact of the matter is 80% of the mortgages that are written in this country right now are backed and underwritten by Freddie and Fannie. Why? Because nobody else will write a mortgage. Nobody else will write a mortgage unless you, the American taxpayer, uh, be on the hook for that mortgage. And that's exactly what happens under Freddie and Fannie. So they're going to start going after people who have started strategically defaulting on their mortgage. Now, it's okay 
if you're sitting at the helm of J.P. Morgan or Goldman Sachs or Wells Fargo or one of these monster uh, institutions that have enough money to grease the wheels of Wall Street to get legislation written on their behalf, it's fine for them to take uh, these kind of uh, exotic investment vehicles, pump them and uh, have their friends at the rating agencies create an, uh, a triple-A rating for them, sell them around the world to the point where we sit in 2012 with the aforementioned carnage happening before our eyes, 46 million food stamps, a uh, million-plus foreclosures a year, the list goes on and on and on. They can do this with carte blanche. They have no worries whatsoever. In fact, we'll do quantitative easing one, two, and now three. We'll do all kinds of stimulus programs. We'll lower the interest rates to nothing so they can continue to be in business because they are too big to fail. But when it comes to you, if you decide to make a smart business decision, by the way, to where your property that you bought in the condition set forth by a Federal Reserve that had a zero interest rate policy and uh, blowing up economies uh, with a one bubble after another, if you decide to make a smart business decision, which is to walk away from a property that has fallen 40, 50, 60% in value, and you have no hope of recouping your investment out of that property, you could come under the full weight and force of the Department of Treasury. In fact, they say, quote, we're going to lock people up. Now, how many dollars are we talking? This must be hundreds of billions of dollars. This must be enough to go after these uh, this malfeasance that will get our uh, deficit in check, right? But try again. It's 100 plus agents that are going to go after a, a grand total of an estimated $1 billion worth of revenue that was lost to people who strategically defaulted. Now, I know this is a little story buried in the third page of the financial uh, website, but this is the direction we are going. We've had four years, four years of fantasy recovery. We've had four years of being told everything's okay. We've had four years of the same exact policy that led to the conditions that occurred in 2008. And guess what, folks? It's all about to happen again. Believe it or not, like it or not, uh, think it's uh, conspiratorial or not, we've just traded the uh, debt from this uh, fraudulent failure in the mortgage-backed securities and these exotic investment vehicles they created then to sovereign debt of planet Earth now. There's a reason why 9 trillion to 16 trillion. There's a reason why Europe is willing to give up their sovereignty uh, in order to have unlimited funds from the European Central Bank. It's because sovereign debt has exploded around this planet, and it will be the final landmine that we step on that will, uh, will lead to the central banks offering us a solution, which is giving up our sovereignty, giving up our freedom to give them more power. All right, I'm going to get into our guest right now because I've planned it on too long there. Doug Weed, top advisor for the Ron Paul campaign, but that isn't, uh, certainly that isn't your whole career. Uh, very, very uh, gifted, talented author, uh, New York Times bestseller with over 30, uh, 30 books written at this point. And uh, really plugged into the mainstream, probably like nobody else we've had on this program. Doug Weed, welcome to the program. You're a hero, and I love your show. Well, thanks, Doug. I appreciate it. That's very kind words coming from you. you I, I'm assuming you heard the whole warm up there. Uh, <laughs> did I miss anything? I mean, I, I mean, is this accurate to where we're at? Yeah, the whole housing thing, it, it just, uh, it's stunning. Uh, that, that was the whole, the main, the main, uh, discussion point in the election. Maybe shouldn't have been, but it was the main discussion point last time around and nobody did anything. I, I, I had friends in, in, uh, the real estate business and some in the mortgage business and they were just kind of stunned that, uh, even little things that could have been done, uh, weren't done. Yeah, I, I, and you're right. In 2010, I'm assuming that's what you're referring to, uh, the uh, the midterm election, this wave election, where, I mean, a lot of this uh, was a topic of the day, but at the end of it, we've settled right exactly back into where we were before. Uh, no no uh, lesson being learned at all. Doug, I went a little long in my opening monologue there. Uh, we're going to take our first break. When we come back, I want to pick your brain about a recent event that you were at, which was the uh, Republican National Convention uh, down in Florida. I read some of your stuff on it. Absolutely fascinating. We're going to be back with a uh, uh, senior advisor for the Ron Paul campaign, Doug Weed, and more Wide Awake News Radio. Three and a half minutes, guys. Hang tight. It's the 17th day of September. Doug Weed, who is uh, not only uh, an outstanding author with 30 books to his credit, he is a, a historian when it comes to uh, presidents and presidential families, is that accurate, Doug? Yeah. Uh-huh. 
Okay. Um, uh, you were also you were also the senior advisor uh, for the Ron Paul campaign, and and I remember reaching out to you uh, via e- email. Uh, I'm trying to remember what when exactly I first started uh, sending you emails because I, I, I was after Maine without a doubt, but it was you know uh, probably uh, maybe a month or two after Maine and watching the. Uh, the debates that were happening and how he would have, you know, prior to these debate, debates when he'd go do a, a campaign stump, he'd have, you know, thousands of people show up to, you know, standing room only. In a lot of cases, they had to wait outside and then watch the mainstream just, uh, you know, uh, blow it off as it didn't even happen and then uh, or, or not even show up, give them any exposure at all. And when they did, and you did it, you did a, a yeoman's job going on all these uh, mainstream uh, networks like Fox and CNN and all these others. Uh, to uh, try to uh, uh, to try to show the position that the, the campaign was taking, which was complete common sense. And every time that you know the, these appearances with the uh, wonder of the internet, every time an appearance like yours was on, it would end up on uh, a, a website somewhere. Maybe it was Zero Hedge, maybe it was some other alternative media site, maybe it was even a mainstream media site. And most of them have comments now that go with it. And every single time you were on or Ron Paul was on. It was just overwhelming support and overwhelming uh, number of people commenting on it. You'd see a, a video uh, or a report from uh, covering uh, Mitt Romney or one of the other uh, jokers, and nobody would even comment on it. We're just so numb to the mainstream and so numb to the normal, uh, uh, average, run-of-the-mill politician that I think most people are turned off by it. Uh, but I, you know, I want to ask you about what happened at the Republican uh, convention in. Uh, in Florida, but but before I do that, let me let's back it up a little bit because you joined Ron Paul's campaign when this this go around from the get go. Uh, yes, uh, let's see. I came on board in May, uh, so uh, yeah, pretty early May. Very early, and uh, we <laughs> we worked for just about a year to get things going. And then you saw what happened. Uh, I mean, you saw the momentum, obviously, that was building for him throughout. You know, when, when uh, Iowa came, and uh, I think it shocked everybody. And we had what the governor of Iowa saying: "If Ron Paul wins, ignore it." Yeah, we were close. We were really close. You know, uh, those wins have sequential power when they happen early, and we came very close to uh, first an upset within just a handful of votes in the Ames straw poll. And, right. But we got a good idea then that uh, we could see that the media, which depends on advertising from the major companies, all of whom benefit from the Federal Reserve and the interest-free loans that go to the banks and in some cases directly to the holding companies of some of the, of the big uh, networks. So we, we could see uh, then we weren't going to get uh, a fair shake on television. Absolutely not. Was there was there a lot of uh, optimism uh, on the grassroots? I mean, it, you know, I remember in 2008, uh, Ron Paul made the ballot in Montana, uh, and I voted for him because, you, you know, and, and uh, I'm probably going to vote for him again this time. It might be in a write-in fashion, but there's certainly uh, the momentum that came out of uh, Audit the Fed uh, and the crisis of 2008, the folks that woke up then and were paying attention, they were really out there uh, with strong support this go-around, correct? Yeah, yeah, Charlie. It, it, it's interesting. Once the lights come on, once uh, so, uh, someone figures this out, uh, there's no going back. They, they're, <laughs> they're steadfast, fervent uh, believers. Uh, it's that's the best way to describe it. Life's coming on, and all of a sudden they can see things they haven't seen before. And uh, the, the question we had all along was, can can we get the message out quick enough to impact uh, the election? Well, and, uh, you know, it really looked like that, uh, that was going to be the case early on. And then the effort by the mainstream, especially the, the GOP leadership, it was unbelievable from uh, from Iowa all the way through to the convention. It was all about uh, making sure that Ron Paul and uh, his delegates and his supporters were either uh, marginalized 
They were trivialized, uh, trivialized on uh, by the mainstream media. They were marginalized by the mainstream media. And what wouldn't work there by hanging a moniker uh, around these folks? Then they did it through uh, back uh, channel ways and changing, you know, changing their own rules uh, to the point where when you went to the uh, Republican uh, National Convention in Florida. I, you know, I, I never, I hadn't spoke to anybody that had been there. I just spoke to people who were there protesting. But I, until I read your article on the security that was there, I was, I, I was uh, kind of in the dark. I had no idea that it was as draconian uh, until I read your uh, your piece on it, security at the RNC that was on your blog by Doug Weed, a senior uh, advisor for the Ron Paul campaign, and. Uh, I apologize for uh, the uh, the drop call there, Doug. I don't know if it was on our end or if it was uh, that reception on your end. Uh, but let, let's get right into it because time's rapidly running out, and i got to pick your brain on a bunch of stuff here. Uh, first off, I, I was talking about the run-up to the convention. We had, uh, we had all these shenanigans going on that were uh, very, very obvious, uh, to, at least to people who followed and cared and didn't buy right into the mainstream media. You would go on a lot of these mainstream uh, programs and try to set the record straight. Uh, and yeah, I think you did a brilliant job, but of course you'd always be uh, with a paid plastic spokesman who tried to uh, spin it a uh, direction that was certainly towards uh, the, you know, the mainstream political uh, choice, candidate of choice. Going through all the run-up to the, the, the RNC, it was really obvious that, you know, Ron Paul wasn't going to get a fair shake at the RNC, but I had no idea of how onerous it was uh, in Florida until I read your blog on it. And I had no idea it was so restrictive as far as security or that they worked so hard to keep Ron Paul's name from even being mentioned uh, mentioned uh, at this convention. Uh, please break it down a little bit for us of what, what that whole experience entailed. <laughs> yeah, it was unbelievable. People with Ron Paul signs uh, were stopped. Uh, marshals would come up to them and a very stern face that said, I'm going to have to take that sign. And if you pull pull out another one, you'll be arrested. Uh, it was yeah. just pretty stunning. Uh, uh, we're talking about old ladies. <laughs> Marshals coming up to old ladies telling them. Uh, it, it was, was this, this in the convention? Was this in the convention center itself, or was this outside? Yes. Yeah, okay. it was in the convention center itself, you yeah. know. This is unbelievable. Oh, this is supposed to be, this convention is supposed to be where delegates from around the country uh, come and voice their opinion, support from their state. Uh, it, you know, yeah. it's supposed to be part cast of our... Uh, go ahead. Yeah, cast their votes. You're right, Charlie. Yeah, so. and we're supposed to be able to stand up and take part in this process and in our great republic, and now you have marshals. If you hold up a sign for uh, Ron Paul that you're going to be, uh, I think in your blog you said escorted out and detained. Correct. Yeah, yeah. That's what they said. One of them, one of them, uh, a Ron Paul person pulled out a little sign and it kind of unfolded, it unrolled. He held it up, and they came and uh, very angry, and they confiscated it. And uh, about uh, five or six minutes later, he pulled out another one and he unfolded. Boy, this really. Then they descended on him. They came from several different angles, and they cornered him, and they they said, if this happens again, you will be escorted from the building and you will be detained. Uh, so they and were warning is, him. This is local uh, Tampa PD? No, is, I don't know who they are. I don't know if they okay. were hired. I assume they were likely hired by the RNC. Okay. The RNC security indoors. This was indoors on the floor. And... Um, uh, of course, they went Dr. Paul himself, but he came out. He made the rounds and visited with some of his delegates. Uh, he was watched carefully and followed everywhere he went by a, uh, a little brigade of these people and very angry looking. I went up to one of them. I said, why don't you arrest him? I said, you, don't, you shouldn't <laughs> allow him on the floor. You can't let him on the floor like that. Go get him and arrest him. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. You know that would have been great. Oh uh, yeah, well, the cameras were there. All the it would have been great. There. But you know what? 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 I mean, this this is I, my I, this got, is my I got take. One of the, Go ahead. I got one of them to crack a smile when I said that. <laughs> but you know what? Does, this is the sad thing. This is the sad thing. If that did happen, 
you know, you'd have the big uh, uh, outcry from uh, Paul supporters or uh, Campaign for Liberty supporters, and uh, the mainstream would absolutely, you know, is this too conspiratorial for me to say this? The mainstream would, by the end of that news broadcast, spin it into this is the best thing for the uh, democracy of the United States of America would be to see Ron Paul in change. I mean, it's in, in uh, cuffs, rather. It just seems to be that much of an overt attack against this man and what he stands for. Yeah, I don't think. I, yeah, I don't think they would have done it. But I was thinking maybe some lower level level official could be egged in to doing it. Yeah. But yeah, no, I think the media would have just ignored it. Uh, that's what yeah. they would have done. I mean, broken bones. When you go on video and you see those videos online that the whole world sees with broken bones and the duly elected. Uh, County chairman has been arrested. Is pointed out by yeah. uh, delegates of another candidate and hired off to the police. Been hired for that purpose, and then they signal out after they're elected and say arrest. That's the one to arrest. They go up and they arrest the man that just got elected county chairman. And when all that's on TV and the drama of it uh, is on YouTube, rather, and you never see that on network news. <laughs> I gotta tell you, there were some producers uh, that were saying, "We gotta show this. We gotta show this." And the executive said, "No, we're not showing it." So to ignore such video drama—that's what TV is made for. To ignore such video drama and not report it. All I can say is, thank God for Al Gore and the internet, or we wouldn't know about any of this stuff. <laughs> well, that's that's no lie. But knowing about it and being able to affect any kind of change, I, I guess, certainly has proven out to be, uh, you know, far, far separated. And you know, all these. I mean, all now we find out about these things, and it's almost, uh, you know, salt in the wound. It, it's certainly the notion of a two-party system, the notion of uh, you know, liberal uh, versus conservative, red versus blue. Uh, I, I think is is so well packaged and so well delivered, uh, and unfortunately, it is still the majority of the people. Even though the number is growing, you know, through uh, you know work for people like you and Ron Paul and uh, others in the campaign for liberty, the, you know, more and more people are waking up. But we have this canned political system and a canned media that seem to work uh, tire uh, effortlessly or uh, without ceasing. Uh, to uh, stifle any kind of uh, true message of uh, liberty and freedom. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> but I don't think it's uh, all in vain. I remember uh, the Reagan years, and the Cold War was on them. It wasn't about the Fed. Uh, it was survival uh, against the communist attempt at world conquest. And... Um, the the media was very hostile to Reagan. They portrayed him as a racist and a warmonger and all these things, and he got elected anyway. He, he won anyway, and I see the same thing now. I, uh, it doesn't matter how the media uh, ignores or marginalizes Dr. Paul. People are catching on. They, um, they've lost the value of their homes. They've lost the value of the IRAs. It, it's This whole thing it has their attention. And they're willing to learn and figure out what's going on. Uh, where's all this money going, and to whom? And uh, uh, Dr. Paul and this movement has the answers. No doubt about it. And, and he is waking more people up. It was it was outstanding in uh, in 2008 when they uh, when they actually let him on television. And, and this this is kind of the insidious part. And uh, hopefully, Brett, you got my message. I want to I want to uh, skip this break. Uh, since we had the connection problem, let's just run through to the end if that's if that's right with you, Brett. Uh, so, but anyway, in 2008, when uh, people like <laughs> apparently, okay, Brett, we want to, we're going to skip this break. Go ahead. Maybe we're not. It's set up on a computer, and he had to override. There, he got rid of it. Good deal, Brett. Uh, in 2008, people like uh, Peter Schiff, Ron Paul. It, it almost seemed that they were led on TV uh, by the mainstream, Doug. I don't know if you notice this or not, and I want your take on this. These folks that, that are kind of icons of alternative media, and certainly Ron Paul, the father of the Tea Party, the father of the uh, Campaign for Liberty movement, uh, you know, he, he was all over the television in 2008. But it was used in a way, I thought, I feel, that was uh, to really let the people know how desperate a condition we were in 
and therefore made a, made the populace a little bit more valuable uh, to accept these extraordinary uh, these extraordinary changes that have happened with our constitution and with our uh, economic system and with uh, capitalism, you know, suspending it in order to save it type of thing. But then as soon as uh, all the legislation was in place and all, uh, you know, this power was handed over uh, to the central bank to uh, basically run amok, he was pigeonholed back into, you know, the crazy Uncle Tinfoil Hat uh, moniker that the mainstream likes to give him. And I found that to be uh, a little bit troubling, but it, a lot of people did grab on to what he was saying in 2008, and they haven't forgotten. And I think you're right. I, I think more and more people, as we continue to go into this uh, economic uh, spiral, will remember the words of uh, Dr. Paul. Yeah, I think so, too. <laughs> once you figure it out, once you can see the huge amounts of money that the Federal Reserve pumps into the economic bloodstream, uh, you can understand why and how the monetary system is diluted. I mean, a young couple today, if they want to start a hamburger restaurant, they get through years of regulation that are purposely built uh, by the monopolies, by the big uh, corporations uh, to keep them out. And then they find out that their tax money is going to subsidize their competitor because the big corporations have lobbies. They go to Washington, they get money. And now we found out on top of all of that, they're getting money direct from the Federal Reserve, hundreds of millions of dollars at zero percent interest to refinance, all in the name of creating jobs. So right. you got a choice. You can work for one of those big companies for seven dollars an hour, but you sure can't start your own restaurant. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly <laughs> so right. Price, the whole system's been corrupted. Totally corrupted. In fact, I, I you probably heard me at the beginning of the program talking about, you know, we have a, uh, the the uh, Freddie and Fanny now going after you know, people who strategically defaulted. And, I, you know, I've had uh, experts on the program, lawyers that uh, were uh, fighting for people who have fraudulently foreclosed on with the MERS scandal and recommended, you know, that, you know, sometimes strategic uh, default is a, a very uh, business-wise solution. But, you know, that, that we can, you know, that's a, that's a topic for a different program. Um, I, I do want to ask you about Rand Paul. Uh, you know, I, I know you know Ron and Rand, and I know you hold out a lot of hope for Rand in the future, you know, grabbing on to uh, his father's message, and maybe uh, if Obama wins this election 2016, if not uh, 2020. But I, I'm telling you, the alternative media, as I'm sure you are aware, they about lost their mind when, uh, when he came out with an endorsement uh, for Mitt Romney. Now, a question I have for you, uh, is, first of all, was it a bona fide endorsement? Because the first thing that popped into my mind when this came out was, are they spinning this uh, into more than it really is? But then after watching the tapes, I'm like, well, you know, this certainly looks like an endorsement to me. So, I mean, is he playing the political game in order to position himself? Um, and, uh, did, I mean, was it this? I mean, to date, Ron Paul still hasn't supported uh, and endorsed uh, Mitt Romney. Uh, I mean, was this a slap in the face? Was this uh, expected? Was there controversy? Uh, Doug Weed, if anybody knows it's you, give us the lowdown. Well, no, I, I don't fully know. I didn't, uh, uh, he didn't ask for my counsel when he made the decision, but, uh, I know that the neocons have, uh, played this game for years and elected their own, uh, in 1964. The last time there was a real revolution in the Republican Party, the conservatives then uh, taking over the, the convention was at the Cow Palace, and Barry Goldwater got the nomination, and everyone knew he was going to go down in defeat. But Richard Nixon got in there, worked, supported him, endorsed him. Many of the, the leading Republicans would not endorse Barry Goldwater. They didn't want to be associated with it. Nixon got in there, he endorsed him, played the party game, and four years later, he won the nomination himself, and the party was very grateful that he had helped raise money and helped be supporting him at their own time. And the result was he won the nomination and the presidency. So somebody has to think politically and get elected. Uh, you know, we, we talk about these 900 military bases. Ron Paul would like to close them all. <laughs> <laughs> None of the other candidates will close even one if 
It's not yeah. like it's it's either 900 or nothing. It's not like, well, yeah, there's 10 bases we could close, or maybe now we could bring troops home from Australia. <laughs> maybe <laughs> Australia is safe. We don't need to borrow money from China to defend Australia from China. You know, but there's nothing. It's either all or nothing. So for someone like Rand to emerge and be more political and get elected, if someone like that can get elected and turn the tide and, and close half of those bases or some other step in the right direction, uh, uh, that's great. We, we all want it uh, pure and we want it back to the Constitution. But if we can start walking back to the Constitution. So I have a lot of respect for Rand Paul. I don't know if another senator like him, I'll put it that way. No doubt about it, and you know he certainly uh, backed and came out and spoke to a, a lot of the same issues uh, of his father, and uh, you know he, he deserves to be commended for that. Uh, you know, you, you talk about you, you're going back to Barry Goldwater and Nixon, and, and how you know that worked in the advantage of Nixon uh, to get the nomination to become president. Hey, are things different now, Doug? I mean, you, you have you do have a very uh, broad uh, knowledge base and, and history uh, in this political game. You know, Nixon was the one that uh, closed the gold window. I mean, do, do we have banks, bankers, and special uh, financial interest uh, more in power now than we did in those days? And, and, I mean, can somebody, even playing the political game, hope to make uh, a difference two or four years or eight years down the road? Um, or are we just so entrenched in special interest, namely, you know, special interest being the Federal Reserve, that uh, that uh, you know all the best efforts and political strategy is going to still in in you up in a place where uh, the the people that we're trying to get into control and into check and you know maybe audit and get rid of um, are so entrenched in the economy, so entrenched uh, in uh, legis- writing, getting legislation written that uh, you know it, it seems almost hopeless at times. Yeah, it is worse. It is it, it, it's worse than it was then because of the sheer uh, size of the corruption, and it, it, it's stunning. I mean, w- when we had that partial audit in 2008, and it showed $16 trillion, I mean, I, I remember, uh, uh, I remember when we, we first got those reports, the, the national debt was $12 trillion back then, and here right. it was $16 trillion. Uh, we could have wiped out 200 years of accumulated national debt with the electronically created money from the Federal Reserve. But to stimulate the economy, uh, we gave it to General Electric. We gave it directly to McDonald's Corporation, to companies. And, of course, most of it went to the banks. Uh, they were represented by the board members of the Federal Reserve. <laughs> they voted themselves trillions of dollars. And some went to, to French banks and to British banks, but even Quite a, quite a bit went to Korean banks. So here's the United States electronically creating money. And where does that come from, Charlie? It comes from all of us because it dilutes the power of the dollar in your pocket. So that's the tax. That's the tax on the poor people who don't know they're being taxed and imagine that they they aren't being taxed, but they are because their money is being diluted. And, and at the same exact time, it's ex- you know this is why it's so easy to draw. Uh, uh, a, an elaborate uh, conspiracy theory, you know, at the same exact time, right, we, we go in where, you know, Frank and Dodd, they help create the mess where we create legislation that it bears, you know, Dodd-Frank. I mean, it bears their name. Uh, it doesn't do anything to bring back, back uh, Glass-Steagall. It doesn't do anything to uh, to re-implement these laws that kept these uh, bank holding companies and, and investment banks uh, separated. Uh, and in the same span of time, Doug, we have uh, all kinds of legislation that comes that seems to usurp freedom, usurp liberty, uh, usurp sovereignty uh, of people of this country, be it through the security industrial complex or the financial industrial complex. And they leave, they always seem to engineer outs in this legislation. Now, I, what I'm talking about is, uh, you know, I think back to the latest uh, uh, debt ceiling debacle where. You know, it was all this hoopla. We're going to go into the dark ages if we don't raise our debt ceiling from 14 trillion to 16 trillion. Nobody could come up with an idea or a solution. So, at the end of the day, instead of uh, of just saying, you know what, uh, 535 member body of Congress has spoken, 
and there can't be no deal, so we're going to stick with the statutory limit, and that's it. We're going to we're going to take the pain that we all know is coming eventually. But instead of that, they cut a deal where it's uh, you know twelve plus one super committee uh, that will hash it out, make sausage as they say in D.C., and uh, they'll come up with a comprehensive plan to rescue the economy through a drawdown of debt and uh, uh, a uh, limiting of, of, of expenditures. And when, if that doesn't work, we'll have this fiscal cliff. And the fiscal cliff is automatic tax increases, automatic spending cuts, and uh, you know we'll, we'll face this automatic trigger, they called it. And I think it's really ironic because now instead of having 535 members of Congress uh, you know, represent their constituency, which is another joke, in my opinion, at this point, we have a super committee that's put into their hands, and when they fail, it gets put into a trigger mechanism. So you have this complete deniability, basically, from all the people surrounding Ron Paul and Rand Paul in the House of Representatives and the Senate, who can just sit back and say, well, you know, it's a trigger. It's uh, The super committee couldn't get it done, and uh, so now we're going to implement uh, these uh, automatic trigger events. It, it, my point is this. There's no accountability in the House of Representatives or the Senate. There's no real power except for the people that hold these long-term positions uh, that can uh, dictate what legislation comes to the floor, what gets voted on. And there's no uh, there's no real solutions coming for the American people, but all these little uh, tokens are put in there, these little trigger events are put in there that, that all mean one thing, that will we'll keep bailing out uh, these institutions, we'll keep raising the debt ceiling, and at the end of the day, when it comes time to pay the piper, we'll let automatic triggers kick in so the American people uh, are the ones who take the take the brunt uh, of this uh, misery and suffering, and you have this uh, political elite class that have this uh, built-in cover. It seems uh, disgusting to me, frankly. And hundreds of millions and billions and trillions of dollars created, uh, which which uh, dilutes the money we have. You know, in the South Carolina debate uh, backstage before it started, uh, Dr. Paul said, hey, we... Uh, you know the only time in the Bible when Jesus lost his temper? I said, yes, Dr. Paul, the, the money changers in the temple. He said, that's right. So if you read that story, he went in there and he sat and he watched. And he said, it took me years to understand the monetary system. And it takes most people years. But, but Jesus sat there one afternoon and he just watched people coming into the temple and giving their money and buying a turtle dove or whatever it was for their sacrifice. And he, he quickly discerned that they were being cheated. Uh, and he, he lost his temper. He couldn't, he, people expect the government, they expect the banks to be honest. They, they don't expect to be, that the value of their money is being diluted. They don't understand that. And he said, Jesus lost his temper. And, uh, Dr. Paul said, that's how I feel when I go out here. These debates, they discuss these nuances of attacks here and attacks there, when this massive tax, which has crushed the middle class and crushing the poor, is totally unaddressed. No one talks about it. It's uh, these trivial things that don't matter, and they're all blind to the real issues. Oh, man, you know what? That That's exactly, exactly, uh, I, I get the exact same feeling. You know, we, we get a vote on, in this republic, this once great republic, we get a vote on nonsensical issues. But when it comes to monetary policy, <laughs> truly right. things that matter, uh, we don't get a say. We don't get a say in, in our currency. We don't have Article One, Section Eight. You know, Congress isn't uh, you know coining money to determine the value of it. We get a vote on gay marriage. We get a vote on things that uh, that are really trivial in the big picture. When you don't control uh, the finances of your nation, you don't control the, your nation, do you? No, that's right. That's absolutely right. And we've lost the value of our home. That's, this was the one the one way we still be middle class. We could ratchet up and buy another home and pay it off and get a down payment and buy a better home. And maybe when we die, we could leave $10,000 to each child. This was our hope of middle class. Not rich, but middle class. Now that's been wiped out. And where does this money go? This money, all this money that's been taken out of our IRAs, we can't invest in the stock market. The money now, that's rigged, we found out. Uh, the, the money's made before the stock even appears on the stock market. There's nothing left for us. It's almost like the Middle Ages where you got a cow. And the dad would say, son, you don't know how great this cow is. It was awful before we had a cow. This is wonderful. <laughs> so they allow us to have the Internet 
and uh, uh, HD TV so we can watch football. Few other things. We got flush toilets. Even kings didn't have flush toilets back in the Middle Ages. But that's what we get. But can we be wealthy? No. The American dream is dead. Indentured debt slave is another way of saying it. I might be taking it to extreme there. Doug Weed, uh, senior advisor for the Ron Paul campaign, a historian and author. Dougweed.com is his website. Uh, please check it out. Doug, we'll get you back on. Hopefully uh, we can avoid some of the technical issues. But uh, I appreciate you coming on. I appreciate your, ef- your effort. And I really appreciate you uh, being uh, awake and aware of what's going on, where we're at. Uh, having the courage to stand up, especially to the mainstream media, as you uh, have done for a long time. Thank you very much for your fight. Thank you very much for coming on the program tonight. Thank you, Charlie. Love your show. All right, man. Thank you very much. Guys, please stay tuned for Jeff Ritz because he is coming up next. Uh, tomorrow night will be myself and Eric Lovely. Uh, it's going to be a good program. Lots to talk about. Eric uh, dropped an article into me a little bit ago talking about bulletproof uh, checkpoints that the TSA is gobbling up uh, like wildfire. We're going to be back. Tomorrow, same time, 5 o'clock west, 8 o'clock east. Myself and Eric Lovely and George Francis coming up next. Have a good night. Peace.